Barry Zeldin. Barnett Barry Zeldin was a 74-year-old experienced hunter who lived in May's Landing with his wife, Janet Zeldin. On Monday, October 7, 2013, he told Janet he was planning to put some bait at a deer stand near Chatsworth in the Warren Grove Recreation Area and left his home with his dog Taffy. This would be the last time anyone saw him. Barry signed in at the Audubon Gun Club on Route 563 at 9.55 a.m. Monday morning. Hunters always sign in there so that everyone knows who's out there. He did not return home that night. At this point, Janet wasn't worried as Barry was known to make some spontaneous hunting trips that lasted several days. The next two days, Janet tried calling him, but all her calls went to voicemail. On the third day, she tried to drive to the Audubon Gun Club to find someone that would help her find Barry, but she wasn't able to find the club. On the fourth day, she tried again, and this time she was able to find the club. She got some members of the club to help her look for Barry. They searched around the area, but couldn't find any sign of him. Then, on the fifth day, while searching for Barry, a few members of the club found Barry's 1972 Chevrolet Blazer. Inside the SUV, they found his car keys, still in the ignition, his cell phone still on the dashboard, and his dog Taffy still waiting for him. The windows of the car were left down, and Taffy had apparently survived on rainwater and corn and molasses meant for the deer. In regards to the dog, Janet theorized that, quote, Barry must have left her to check on the deer stand or to put some apples out, and there was a medical emergency. Taffy does what she's told, so he must have told her to stay put. The New Jersey State Police and State Park Police carried out a massive search using helicopters and canine units. At first, the searchers concentrated on the Warren Grove Recreation Area, but they soon expanded to include other parts of the wilderness closer to Bass River State Forest in New Jersey. The search was soon called off when they couldn't find any sign of Barry anywhere in the area. The searchers returned a few more times to the area, but they still couldn't find any trace of Barry. Janet said, quote, Taffy is always looking for Barry to come home. When someone comes to the door or she hears a squeak of the garage door, she runs to it and she clings to me all the time, which she never did. Barry remains missing to this day. Bobby Packnan. In August 1963, Bobby Packnan, along with his three brothers, Ted, Jim, and Bill, went on a camping trip along with their parents at Deep Lake Resort in Stevens County, Washington, about 20 miles from the Canadian border. On the 3rd of August, Bobby, Jim, and Bill went for a hike with their mother, Edna, alongside an isolated logging trail near the campsite. Ted and his father had decided to stay behind at the campsite and go fishing instead. During their hike, Bill heard a creek nearby and asked his mother if he could check it out. Edna agreed and followed him, telling Jim and Bobby to wait on the trail. However, Jim didn't listen and followed Bill and his mother down the creek, leaving Bobby standing alone. The creek was only 100 to 150 feet from the trail, and they were only gone for a couple of minutes, but when they returned to the trail, Bobby was nowhere to be seen. He had been barefoot, but no footprints were found. They searched him and called out to him, but couldn't find any sign of him. They eventually notified authorities, and an extensive search was carried out involving bloodhounds and over 4,000 volunteers. Searchers traveled deep into the remote Deep Lake area that surrounded the campsite. The area was hilly and rugged and was difficult to navigate. Sniffer dogs were brought in, and they picked up a scent that ran for a couple of miles before abruptly stopping at a fork in the road. At the time of his disappearance, Bobby was 2 feet 8 inches tall, 30 pounds, with blonde hair. He was wearing blue shorts and was barefoot. Authorities considered the possibility that Bobby could have been abducted, but due to the remote location where the family was located, they believed it's unlikely. Authorities theorized that Bobby got lost trying to follow Jim and was attacked by a wild predator, such as a cougar, bear, or an eagle. Both of Bobby's parents are now deceased, but his brothers are all still alive. Bobby's case remains unsolved to this day. Connie Johnson Connie Johnson was a 76-year-old experienced outdoors woman working as a camp cook for Ritchie Outfitters of Salmon, Idaho in the area around Fog Mountain near Big Rock. Ritchie Outfitters organized hunting trips in the Montana and Idaho wilderness. 
She'd previously worked as a U.S. Forest Service Wilderness Ranger at the Moose Creek Ranger Station. She was also a member of the Selway Bitterroot Foundation, and she frequently led young people and other groups on tours of the backcountry. She was known to have very good survival skills and 25 years of wilderness experience. The camp she was working at was only accessible on foot or by horseback. On October 2, 2018, the hunters left the camp for a while. Connie stayed at the camp along with her dog, Ace. The next day, Connie contacted the hunters by radio, but they were unable to understand what she was saying. When the hunters returned on October 5th, Connie and Ace were nowhere to be seen. She had left her jacket behind on a table, lying on top of her gun. After searching around the area and finding no sign of either of them, the hunters notified the authorities. A massive search was carried out, involving aircraft deploying FLIR heat technology from the U.S. Air Force, the Idaho National Guard, the Clearwater County Backcountry Helicopter Rescue Team, and several teams of tracking dogs and searchers on foot. However, no trace of Connie or her dog was found, and the search was called off on October 16th. Three weeks later, Ace would turn up at the Moose Creek Ranger Station. Ace was discovered about 15 miles from the hunting camp where Connie was last seen. He was reportedly found in good condition, not hungry or struggling in any way, and was checked over by a vet. Connie's family worked with the True North Search Dogs, a nonprofit organization out of Helena, Montana, to transport Ace back to the search area in an attempt to find Connie, but to no avail. Connie's daughter does not believe her mother's disappearance was intentional. It's also worth noting that another man would disappear on the same day, not too far from Connie. Terrence Woods would go missing around 5 p.m. on the same day in the Oro Grande area of Idaho. The 27-year-old was a production assistant from Maryland, helping film a documentary on abandoned gold mines for a British TV show called Whitewater. He was supposed to be working on the film until November, but a few days before his disappearance, he texted his parents to say he was cutting his trip short and would come home on October 10th. When the police questioned the production team, they said that after finishing the shoot and when the crew was wrapping up, Terrence approached a ridge which dropped steeply away down a hillside to the forest below. When all of a sudden, he dropped his two-way radio that he was holding and started running fast down the hill into the forest below. At first, the rest of the crew thought he might have fallen off the cliff, but when they arrived at the cliff, they saw him down at the bottom, still running until he disappeared into the trees. The crew called out for him, but he didn't return. They went looking for him, but couldn't find him. They would eventually report him missing to the police. Despite an extensive search of the area, no sign of Terrence was ever found. Connie and Terrence remain missing to this day. Stacy Aris. On the 25th of July, 1981, 14-year-old Stacy Aris from Saratoga went on a four-day horse riding trip with her father in the Sunrise Meadows area of Yosemite National Park in California. They were part of an eight-person group riding on horses and mules. The group reached a cluster of cabins designed for overnight stay at Sunrise High Sierra Camp. They tied up their horses and mules and went indoors to freshen up. Stacy cleaned up, showered, and changed clothes. While the group was resting, Stacy told her father she wanted to hike down and take pictures of a nearby lake. She asked him if he wanted to go with her, but he declined. An elderly man named Gerald Stewart from their group accompanied her instead. The group saw the two going down the hill towards the lake. After walking a little while down the hill, Gerald felt tired and sat down. Stacy then told Gerald that she would continue and go to the lake. The lake could have been either a few hundred feet away or as long as 1.5 miles away. The exact location is not clear. The group watched Stacy walk further towards the lake. They then saw her go behind some trees and disappear from sight. This would be the last time she was ever seen. When Stacy didn't return, the elderly man got up to look for her, then gathered the remainder of the group to search more extensively. He later reported that he'd spoken with a group of hikers, but they said they hadn't seen her. The group did find a lens from her camera, but no other trace of her. After the initial search, 
Stacy was reported missing to the authorities. Rescue crews invested extensive efforts to finding her. About 150 people looked for the teen, which included roughly 67 Mountain Rescue Association volunteers, dogs, and helicopters, all canvassing a three to five square mile area around Sunrise Lake. Despite this, the camera lens is the only clue. Stacy reportedly had several other items on her person. She was wearing an ankle bracelet and possibly stud earrings, as well as carrying binoculars and her camera. None of these items ever turned up. It is possible that she was abducted as there was no sign of an animal attack and given the proximity to the camp, it's hard to believe she would have lost her way. For 39 years, Stacy has remained missing. Gloria McDonald on the 26th of January, 2001, Gloria Whitemore McDonald went for a hike in Queen Wilhelmina State Park in Polk County, Arkansas. She was accompanied by her husband, her husband's son, and the son's girlfriend. The group began heading down towards the Lover's Leap area of the park at around 12.25 p.m. About 150 yards down the trail, the group found several tree limbs and debris blocking the trail. At this point, Gloria decided to not continue any further and told the others that she was returning to the lodge, which housed a restaurant, gift shop, and additional facilities. Others decided to continue on without her. About 30 minutes later, the group returned to the lodge, but they could not find Gloria anywhere. The car the group had used to travel to the lodge was parked in the same location they had left it, and Gloria's purse was locked inside. A search of the car indicated none of Gloria's personal belongings were missing. On January 27th, the Arkansas State Police special agents were contacted by Polk County Sheriff's deputies at Mina after a search of the Queen Wilhelmina Lodge area failed to find any sign of Gloria. An extensive search of the area was conducted using sniffer dogs, helicopters, and search and rescue teams. The sniffer dogs followed a scent which led down to a paved road below the lodge, but they lost the scent at the road. At the time, there were about six people there who worked for the state park. The kitchen help, waitresses, as well as a few men piling brush and cleaning up after a previous night's storm. However, none of them had seen Gloria. Gloria was a court reporter for the Mina Star newspaper, and some believed that someone she had written about could have abducted her. But after reviewing her articles and notes, they couldn't find any clue that might lead to her abduction. The family theorized that she may have walked up on something involving illegal drug activity and was murdered to keep her quiet. Police had initially suspected Gloria's husband, Daniel, as having something to do with her disappearance, and they asked him to take a lie detector test, which he passed. Less than a week after his wife's disappearance, Daniel said he would move back to Florida and didn't want to stay in Mina, which was considered odd as his wife was still missing and if she did return, she would return to her house in Mina first. In an interview, Daniel also said that he couldn't imagine anyone abducting his wife, quote, for her body, end quote, as she couldn't be considered pretty. Daniel hasn't been ruled out as a suspect, but there's no evidence against him either. Daniel's son said that his father can sometimes come across the wrong way, but he's a great man. He just says whatever comes to his mind at the time. His son said that all three members from the group were interrogated separately. Police had seized his camera and found pictures taken on the day, but couldn't find any photos of Gloria. Besides Daniel, Daniel's son, and Daniel's girlfriend, no one else had seen Gloria in the park except for a maintenance worker. The worker had said that he may have seen a woman in a yellow jacket, which Gloria was wearing at the time, but he wasn't sure. Gloria was described as weighing about 120 pounds, 5 feet 6 inches tall, and wearing a bright yellow hooded jacket, blue plaid shirt, blue jeans, and tennis shoes when she was last seen. She was also seen carrying a Minolita River Zoom 90 camera at the time of her disappearance. She remains missing to this day.